that is currently escalating politically, entrepreneurially, and business-wise across the entire world. And while this may sound like a terribly, terribly boring subject, doesn't it? <laughs> You'll find that. This, it's got quite a few interesting historical parallels, and it ties beautifully in with the last speaker. That's the best way I can possibly top building, building space rockets. So, presenting. I'm going to talk about shelters. Shelters. And I'm going to talk about windmills. But first, a brief introduction. My organization is known as Piratpartiet in Swedish. The Pirate Party. We exist in uh, just over 40 countries, including here in the uh, Netherlands, known as the Piratenpartei. We were created on January 1st, 2006. We, uh, in last election in Sweden, we, we became the largest party for, for first-time voters, sending shockwaves through the, in the entire establishments with 7.1% of the vote total. And we did this on a shoestring budget. Our campaign budget total was 50,000 euros. The old parties had a combined budget of six, of six million, and we beat them. So, how, how do we did, did we do this? Well, basically, we're a civil liberties movement. We are fighting for a range of policies that, if you're active on the net, would seem very sane and sensible, and therefore, are quite heavily opposed by today's industries. And this is where the last speaker ties in beautifully. We are fighting for the freedom to create. We are fighting for the freedom to invent. Because governments don't do that. Invention by committee has quite a poor record. And most importantly, most importantly for this talk, that the same laws should apply online and offline. Well, don't they? No, apparently they don't. But first, let's, let's look at this historically. We are here talking about the mobile distribution game, so this is not going to be a boring history lesson. We're going to talk about previous distribution games when it comes to copyright, when it comes to how you distribute culture, knowledge, products, content. Because when you look at the copyright wars, it turns out that there really isn't anything new under the sun. All of this has happened before, and all of this will happen again. Which is a quote from where? Okay, you score a big fat F on nerd culture. It's a quote from Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> Let's go back to 1453, which rocked the world back then with what invention? Yes, the printing press. At that point, the Catholic Church had a complete stranglehold of the world's knowledge and culture. Whatever the Church said was true, was true. And if you're in that position, well, you don't need any laws created for you, because if you, if you control what lawmakers know, they will never enact a law against you. So what happened with the printing press was that this stranglehold of the world's knowledge and culture was broken. And the Catholic Church panicked, absolutely panicked. Ranging from arguments to how will the monks get paid, the ones that used to copy books, yes, that was actually used, to ver the most extreme things that run, ranging from heresy and everything, they actually managed in 1535 in France to get the printing press banned. France was one of the last countries in Europe to legalize the printing press. In retrospect, that sounds, well, pretty much ridiculous, doesn't it? And still, this is what happens when you have a power struggle over culture and knowledge. This is what happens when you have a power struggle over the freedom to create, the freedom to invent, and the freedom to research. If you invent something that goes against the powers that be, they will try to shut you down. And that has happened more times in history. 
The UK realized you couldn't, this ban in France wasn't particularly effective because many, many, a, a pearl, many, many uh, pirate printing presses, well, they were pirates by definition because they were printing presses, were set up along the borders of France and smuggled books into the country because the demand was huge. UK took a different approach. They realized that, okay, you can't ban this because it's got such a broad appeal. So, the uh, Queen. Queen Mary I, also known as Bloody Mary, because she really didn't like Protestantism and wanted to reintroduce Catholicism into the country, hence the name Bloody Mary, because she did so with quite a violent fervor, realized that, okay, you need an unholy alliance with the industry. So she came to an agreement with a printing guild in London known as the London Company of Stationers and said that, okay guys, you get a complete monopoly on all printing in the, in the country. And you even get to burn books printed by other publishers in return for our little, well, our little censorship mechanism here. We get to determine what you print. In return, you get to print whatever you want after we want it. And so, the freedom to invent died. The freedom to create died. This monopoly was enacted on May 4, 1557. It was named copyright and it is still around. Fast forward, Catholic Church lost its stranglehold on culture and knowledge. Ironically, the copyright lobby, the publishers took over that role. 1849, another milestone in culture for, you, for um, our civilization, libraries. The UK started to think about the idea of, well, we have these rich folks who have lots of books, but they lend their books to people who don't have them. In, that, in this particular age and time, all households typically had four books. The, um, the farmer's little, little practical book on when to sow and harvest, the Bible, uh, uh, the uh, Luther's interpretation of the Bible, and, oh yeah, the psalm book. So, lending books from these rich folks actually was quite of a privilege, and it turned out that politicians thought that, you know, why should only rich folks be allowed to determine who gets to borrow books? Maybe we should have public libraries. And the publishers went completely mad. You can't let people read books for free. If they, if they don't pay for reading books, Nobody will be able to write, make a living off of writing a book ever again. Not a single book will be written if you open the public library. Well, turns out that the UK legislators figured that public access to knowledge had a larger value to society than uh, had the publisher's monopoly. So they did open the first public library in 1850, and as we all know, not a single book has been written after that. Either that or the argument is bogus, as bogus today as it was then. Uh, the publishing industry has gone on to try to outlaw every single new threat to its dominance. Libraries, the player piano, broadcast radio, tape recorder, photocopy, cassette recorder, video cassette recorder, and MP3 player. Which is when this starts to sound quite ridiculous. So where do we come in? Well, we're fighting for the freedom to invent, we're fighting for the freedom to create, and we're a civil liberties movement. Because the copyright battle is not about numbers, percentages, or bottom lines. We're fighting for the same laws to apply online and offline, and we're fighting for something as basic as the postal secret. If it's illegal for me to send a, a piece of music and email to you guys, and it is, if you're to enforce that, well, you can't do that with anything less than actually opening the email, can you? You can't, br you can't have a postal secret for some sort of content, but not for others, because there's no way to tell which is which without breaking the postal secret. Same thing if we're in a chat channel together and I drop a video clip there. You can't catch that without actually eavesdropping on the video, uh, eavesdropping on the private communication. Anonymity, same thing there. We demand that if, you, if you're putting a letter in the mail, well, you determine whether 
you determine yourself if you say who you are or you don't. We demand the same rules to apply online. And if you don't do that, well, out goes reporters' protection of sources, along with, with the postal secret. We demand the messenger immunity, the messenger's right to be immune against any infraction by a, in a sealed letter. The copyright lobby is heavily attacking internet operators to be liable for what their users do. There are numerous examples of this. If a mail carrier would be responsible for the contents of a message, they will have to shut the phone system and the mail system down. The Swedish Postal Service is the country's larger distributor on, of narcotics. Nobody would challenge, challenge them over that. We demanded the freedom to communicate, that we shouldn't be censored. Pe politicians tend to see the internet as something disparate from reality. And this is again mobile distribution. They tend to see it as some toy you can take away from kids when they've been bad. The internet is not a right. Hell yes, it is. It is as important as electricity and running water today. And more important than television and fixed landline phones. The internet is a fundamental part of society and politicians don't understand that as little as they understand exponential growth. So let's what? Let's teach them, absolutely. And the best way to teach them, it turns out, is actually to take their job. <laughs> because that's the only way you can make them care. The right to privacy. Again, we're a civil liberties movement, first and foremost. There are now proposals to uh, to track your mobile phone wherever you go in case it, the government needs to use it against you. Log every contact you have, even every, every search you make on Google and Yahoo and other services in case the government needs to use it against you. But again, this is mostly, I'm talking mostly about the copyright battle here. Should be noted though that in the data, data retention directive, which is this law tracking our, our every step using the mobile phone in the city, the record label lobby said that, yes, we applaud this initiative, and we would, we would also like independent access to the surveillance data, which tells you something about their mindset. Because file sharing will never stop. It will never stop. A while back, we were exchanging music on cassette types. Then we started exchanging programs on diskettes. Then it came became over the internet, and a couple, of, a couple of years back, I predicted that with the, with the advent of the first open platform phone, there would be Bluetooth file sharing. So I would be able to sit here, press a button, and share all of my content with this entire room with nobody, be able to, with nobody being able to see who is sending what and, and to whom. How are we going to stop that? You can't. Not with anything less than shutting down the entire internet. And I was right, it turns out. One of the first apps for Android, 1.5, was Bluetooth file sharing. Doesn't work on, doesn't work on HTC Desire, pity. But the HTC Desire has as much storage as hard drives did when Napster arrived, which again brings us back to exponential growth. So open, mo open platforms and mobile devices make this game very, very interesting. The only way to stop file sharing, and the copyright lobby will stop at nothing less, is to kill the internet and buy it mobile entrepreneurship. The current strangleholders of culture and knowledge are trying to kill your mobile distribution game. There's an example with a Dutch verdict, which happened j just last week, where the judge handed out a verdict saying that talking about a file name is legally the same as hosting it for free download. That's basically insane, but it tells you some what these lobbies are trying to accomplish. They're trying 
to restrict the right to invent and create to the elite that previously had the privilege. It later turned out that the, this particular judge had a common business. I learned this just a couple of hours ago. This particular judge had a common business with the copyright lobby's lawyer in that very case. So I expect that scandal to pretty much detonate over the course of tomorrow. So what this has done is that it has gone from being a market game to being a political game. There are a couple of very, very powerful players who have taken their market dominance and are trying to brick and mortar it into the law book. What we are fighting for is not really that, it's not really rocket science, but this, this it is what the copyright was are about. The lobby would like to have you believe that it's about 4% losses, that it's about last year quarter summary, that it's about the, some imagined right to profit as if there were such a thing. It's not. When you look at what they're fighting for, this is what's at stake. The game has become political. It's about fundamental civil liberties that are at stake and need to be eroded or abolished in order to safeguard a crumbling monopoly. Which is the battle that brought us into the European Parliament. But there's more to it. We're talking about the next generation of, of jobs. You're all bright people, you're pioneers, you're entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship here is at stake as well. We're talking about the freedom to create, the freedom to invent. So, in doing that, you need a functioning market, and you don't have that if the last generation's industries get to legislate their monopoly on the law book. And they're doing just that right now. So, you could always ask, well, how do you build a business out of giving things away for free? Well, you could ask Metro for, for a brick and mortar store. Or how do you compete with free by selling something that isn't? Well, you could ask Volvic and Evian. And, and this, is, this is brick and mortar stuff. This is not, again, it's proven that it isn't rocket science. So we are trying to build an entrepreneur climate where you have the freedom to create, the freedom to invent, and one that isn't where vital civil liberties aren't sacrificed by dinosaurs. And if these dinosaurs need this reduction in civil liberties for their business to operate, well, then I'm sorry, they just need to die. It's, practically, it's actually that simple. This is a political battle. It ceased to be a market battle, it is a political battle. It's taking place in courtrooms, it's taking place at elections. I know that you have an election two days from, two days from now. A, the smallest victory for the Dutch Piraten Partei would send shockwaves across the world. I, I hear there is an animal rights party that got one or two seats in parliament last election and now all the parties are trying to copy their, their agenda frag, frantically in order to not lose votes again. Imagine that happening all over the world. That's what's going to happen if the Piraten Partei gets just one seat in Parliament. That might be something to talk about in the, in the few coming days. It will turn the ears of politicians and it will have a global impact. Because I'm here from Sweden because the world is watching the Dutch election on this issue. So, with that said, shelters or windmills? Do you want to build shelters or windmills? That comes from a Chinese proverb, that when winds of change are blowing, some people build shelters and others windmills. What do you want to build?
I do have the mic. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Boris. So the producers of Avatar, they probably made a few billion. Would your suggestion be that they just make less money or make money in a different way? So the question was producers, I'm repeating your question because the mic was, I only heard you not through the mic here. How do we suggest that producers make money? First of all, it's not a politician's problem. In Soviet Union, a politician could say that you over there, you look kind of sturdy. You should work as a builder all your life and make money in this way. You look kind of artsy. I think you should play the guitar and make money in this way. You could say that in the Soviet Union. You can't do that in a market economy. It's not a politician's job. It's a politician's job to safeguard civil liberties and the basic structures of, of, of democracy. Second, it's not a problem at all. Hollywood had its best year ever in 2009, beating its previous record year of 2008. The income, the income to the music sector has been constant since the arrival of Napster in 1999. However, record sales are dwindling. They're just, they're just falling through the, flu, through the floor, which is extremely positive because these were parasitic middlemen that used to take over 90% of the cut. If the overall income is the same, and it is, and these middlemen are disappearing, that means much more money is going to artists, and it is. Third, even if it were a problem, even if, no, third, I think the issue, the question, how will, what will happen if producers can't make money, ignores the very basic human fact that we create because we love to create. Somebody building a spaceship in their garage doesn't do it for the money, they do it because it's cool as all hell. And this thinking that money is required for a great invention ignores things like Linux, Wikipedia, the fact that we've been creating culture since we were writing, drawing red lines on the insides of caves 30,000 30, years ago. So I don't, I don't think it's a problem. I think, I think there are so many questions in the audience that we should actually just leave it for the drinks. I think uh, you will be here, right, for the drinks? I heard something about drinks. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to wrap this event up. I want to thank you, Rick. Uh, well, thank you. In the thank first you for place. the invitation. Thank you for being our special guest.